Hello and a very good day. Uh, thank you so much for joining in on this webinar. My name is Abhilash. The people here at Manage Engine call me Abhi, and I will be your presenter for today. Right. Uh, thank you so much for joining in again on this webinar. I understand that it is the middle of the week and most of us are working from home. We're with families, we're busy, and I'd like to thank all of you for making out the time and for joining in on this webinar. Uh, before we go ahead and jump in, uh, I'm working from home and I'm pretty sure most of you all are working from home or at remote places as well. So I just wanted to run a quick audio and a video check uh, because I wanted to make sure that everybody out here today are able to hear me well and are able to see the screen well, right? So if my voice is well and audible without any distortion, without any breakage in the audio, if you could give me a confirmation using the chat window or the Q&A tab, that would be extremely helpful. Just say yes, just say okay, just say great. So I can confirm that my voice is reaching to you well and clear. Thank you so much guys for your responses. Looks like everything is good. Uh, I hope you can see the video as well, the title and my email ID. Perfect, thank you guys. Thank you so much for your responses. Uh, at any point in time, if you feel the audio is cutting off or if you feel there's like a lag between the audio and video, uh, just let me know using the chat window and I'll do my best to get that fixed from my end as soon as possible. Okay, so the topic for today is uh, Active Directory Security, Domain Admin Access Before Lunch, right? That's a pretty attractive title and uh, what are we going to talk about in today's session? And before I jump into today's session, I just wanted to give you a little introduction on the IT security masterclass that this series is all about, right? So the whole aim or the goal of the IT security masterclass is to give you a holistic and a complete view on network security. Not parts of your network, for example, not just data, not just Active Directory, not just your servers, but potentially your entire network. Right? So this is going to be a full day session. Uh, day one and day two will be handled by me. Day three and day four will be handled by my colleague, Ram. So what are we going to discuss on day one and day two? Uh, the idea for day one and day two is to look into specific components of your IT environments. Right? Components like Active Directory, cloud components like Azure, and data storage. Right? So these are the three most important components in any IT environment right now. So Active Directory holds your on-premise data, Azure holds your cloud, and file and data storage devices in your network holds your data, which is your currency. Right? So day one and day two, I'll be covering these components, the security of these components in particular. Day three and day four, my colleague Ram will take you through a, a complete view on network security, right? So where he will be covering endpoint security, he will be talking about security of other operating systems like Linux security. He may be covering uh, more network-based threats like ransomware attacks or any devices connected to your network like your web servers, your databases, etc. So day one and day two will be AD, Azure and data storage specific. Day three and day four will be a more wholesome uh, session on network and how you can secure, right? So the whole aim of this IT security masterclass is not to uh, have a class like the name suggests, not to have a lecture, but just a conversation on security, right? These entire sessions, the session that's happening today, the session, the next session of mine will be happening on July 6th. All of these sessions will be recorded and the recordings will be shared to your respective email addresses. So please do not worry about the slide deck. Please do not worry about the recording. They will be shared to your email addresses uh, as soon as the webinar is done. Probably within the next one to two days, the recordings and the slide decks will reach your email addresses, right? So what's today's goal? Today's goal is Active Directory Security, right? So why did we choose to speak about Active Directory Security? Because yes, I'm not disagreeing that the IT landscape of organizations like yours have changed. I'm not disagreeing that cloud applications or cloud environments 
are an integral part of IT and uh, IT environments. But the truth is, if you attended this webinar today, Active Directory is probably a crucial part of your IT infrastructure. Active Directory is probably a single point of authentication and authorization to, the, to your users and to the servers connected in your network. Right? And often what we do is we spend our time trying to secure our network, trying to install antivirus and anti-malware solutions, trying to secure our devices in the perimeter, like routers or VPNs and the like, but we tend to forget about Active Directory security. Right? Active Directory is like an open phone book. It's got the details of your users, their credentials, it's got details of your servers, and if an attacker gains access to that phone book, it's only a matter of time before he or she compromises your domain sensitive data, right? So before I jump in, I just wanted to share with you a quick survey right here. So this is a survey we have been working on. These are just a couple of questions, just 14 questions right here with multiple choice options. Uh, just let me know your thoughts on this survey. The reason for this is because based on your answers to the survey, we will conduct another webinar later on uh, with based on the results of the survey. So that webinar will be more catered towards your requirements or your use cases. And again, that webinar will be based on your answers to the survey. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly leave a link to the survey in the chat window. So whenever you have the time, just check out the link, fill it up for us. That would be very helpful. And when we set up the webinar, we will definitely email you and we will uh, invite you, we will intimate you, so you can come and check out the webinar and you can secure your active directory better, right? So this is something we have been working on. I just wanted to share that out with you, but let's proceed with today's session, right? So active directory attacks, what has changed? The truth is active directory attacks remain the same, right? Stealing passwords, escalating privileges, abusing permissions, password brute force attacks, password spray attacks, attacking Azure environments from Active Directory, uh, simulating domain controllers or rogue domain controller attacks. The list simply goes on. The attacks, they remain the same, but the methods or the techniques used for the attack, well, they are different, right? Attackers, they uh, are using different techniques than before to perform the same attack. So what I'm trying to say here is the methods vary, but now what attackers are also doing is that they are disguising these attacks with your legitimate Windows tools, right? Tools and features built into your Active Directory to your Windows OS are now being used in attacks, which we will look into in today's session, right? So how long does it take to become domain admin? Because the title is domain admin access before lunch. How long does it take to become a domain admin? The answer to that question is, it's not easy to tell, but as soon as an attacker gains access to your endpoint, right? It is speculated that within the next two to three days, your attacker can become a domain admin, right? Just access to your one endpoint in your active directory environment. And now that's even more possible because we're all working remote and that will give an attacker access to move up, escalate privileges, move up the network hierarchy and eventually become a domain admin. Right? So why do attacks in Active Directory happen? According to me, there are three reasons Active Directory attacks happen. Number one is there are certain areas in your Active Directory that are unmonitored. There are certain areas in your Active Directory for which security logging is not enabled. The second reason I feel attackers happen, attacks happen in Active Directory is because Active Directory has certain permissions that are either wrong, that are either misconfigured, that are either not noticed by the admin or that are liberally granted to your users, right? Misconfigured permissions is another reason why Active Directory attacks happen. And last but not the least, like any software, Active Directory has its own set of vulnerabilities or issues which causes attacks again, right? So without further ado, let's take a look at a few gaps in Active Directory security and how that can give you domain admin access, preferably before lunch. Right. The first attack I wanted to start off this webinar with is actually an endpoint attack. Right. So I'm going to show you a quick 40 second video right here. I'm not going to say anything. Just take a look at it and we will talk about it after. 
right? So here I go, one, two, three, I'm gonna play the video right now. I hope you got a quick look at the video. I'd be more than happy to share the link with you again. But what the attack is, is a simple Excel document or a Microsoft document, right? When a user executes it, what happens is uh, a key logger is, is installed on the user system, right? So where is the key logger installed? It's installed on the scheduled tasks of the system. Right. So what happens is the scheduled tasks will run the keylogger at predefined intervals. And when the keylogger attack is run or the script is run, uh, the user's key presses will be recorded. That's number one. And periodic screenshots will be taken off the user's system and they will be sent to a remote FTP server. A simple attack, a user installs it or opens a document, keylogger is installed, and the keylogger records the key presses, takes screenshots of the system sends the key presses and the screenshots for the victim system to a remote server, which is the attacker server, right? If the user had ever entered credentials, for instance, if the user ever tried to remotely log on to another system by entering credentials, uh, preferably the admin credentials, then the attacker would have captured those credentials via screenshots or key presses, right? Just a simple way I wanted to start off this webinar with where an endpoint, an infected endpoint, can lead to a security incident. And I wanted to talk about endpoints right now, more importantly than ever, because we're all working remotely and endpoint security right now, especially with respect to Active Directory, is all the more important, right? You gotta monitor everything on your endpoint because from an endpoint, an attacker can access the apps and services that are running on the endpoint, escalate privileges and gain access to a higher privileged account or your data. Uh, an attacker can access other endpoints from an endpoint or other workstations from an endpoint. Eventually my point here being your data, your privilege escalation, your domain admin access can all occur with just endpoint access, right? So you gotta watch all your endpoints for security changes, even a simple activity like a logon or VPN logon a remote log onto an endpoint must be monitored because it could be an attacker trying to brute force into an active directory endpoint, right? So why do such attacks happen? Uh, why do uh, active directory attacks really happen no matter what it is? Why do they happen? Uh, there are three reasons why active directory attacks happen. Number one is security logging is not enabled. So what do I mean by security logging? If you open up your group policies, Right? You've got something called audit policies here over which you can see certain events. Right? So when you audit these events, like log on events or group membership changes events, when you configure these events, what happens is uh, they will be any change to your groups, for instance, in Active Directory or any log on that's occurring on your Active Directory or any object based change in your Active Directory, like a file or folder change. All of these changes will be recorded and they will be stored in an interface called the Windows Event Viewer, which in which the security log, you can view all of these events, right? So audit policies are used to monitor your Active Directory environment. They record logs, the logs are pushed to the Event Viewer, the security log using which you can view the events, right? In most organizations I've noticed, uh, the required audit policies are not enabled. That's the first problem. Right? The second problem is these events that are recorded due to the audit policies are too much to handle, right? So as you can see, there are close to 13 lakh events here just on my endpoint, right? Imagine what you would do when you had to monitor events across all your endpoints in your Active Directory environment, right? So what typically happens in Active Directory environments is that an uh, the admin 
takes your Windows endpoints, Linux endpoints, and it, they take all the security events and they try and send them or forward them to a central server, right? The server could be a domain controller, the server could be a member server. So basically all of these forwarded events are sent to a collector server, right? That can be used to monitor events across all of your endpoints, right? But what's the problem with this approach? If you take a look at my endpoint here, there are close to 13 lakh logs. Now imagine the logs that are being forwarded from multiple endpoints in your network. So if you want to view those logs, you can view them in the forwarded events, but there will be too much. It's too much to handle. It's too much to read. And none of these logs give you a bird's eye view on what's happening in Active Directory. So you'll manually have to click open, check out each log to truly understand what's happening. And when you have to do that for all events across all your endpoints, it gets very, very confusing. Right? Now, the reason Active Directory attacks happen is because A, the security logging is not enabled at all, and B, the logs that are being stored on your event viewer across your servers are not being interpreted effectively. They are not being read into effectively, right? So let's take a look at a few more examples, how a misconfigured permission can dismantle your Active Directory. Now, if you can recollect, I gave you three reasons why Active Directory attacks happen. Number one, misconfigurations. Number two is unmonitored areas. Number three is vulnerabilities with the Active Directory platform, right? So let's take a look at a few misconfigurations. So what can a non-privileged user do in Active Directory, right? So a non-privileged user can essentially use a shell like PowerShell, for example, to run commands and extract information from Active Directory. For example, What's the default domain password policy? Who are the members of the administrators group, right? And as a matter of fact, there are tools on the internet, like you can see here called go dump domain info that are used to extract information from Active Directory in bulk, right? Like who are your enterprise admins? Who are, what are your domain computers? And who are your users who have been delegated admin privileges, right? So what I'm trying to say here is an endpoint, a user with no privileges whatsoever can run commands in Active Directory and extract information from Active Directory, right? And what can attackers do with the information that they've extracted? They can launch an attack, right? So let me show you something right here. Now, let's assume that I know who the members of the administrators group are, right? Let's assume that I know what the password policy of the domain looks like, right? Now I know what the minimum password length is. And if I wanted to launch a password spray attack, it's pretty straightforward. All I got to do is import a script that I have on my system right here. It's a PowerShell script, and I'm going to launch a password spray attack, right? Pretty straightforward, invoke domain password spray, and I have a password, password at one, two, three, and here I have users and their plain text passwords right in front of me, right? So what I'm trying to say here is from an endpoint with no privileges, your end users can query for AD information and not just query for AD information, but also launch attacks, right? This is an example of how something when unmonitored can lead to a security incident, right? Unmonitored area. Let's take a look at some more areas uh, where permissions can be misconfigured and how that can lead to a security incident, right? Now you've got services running on your endpoints. So if you open up your services, you've got your services running on your endpoints and most services in your endpoints run with system privileges, right? If you check this out, this is the local system account. These services run with system privileges right here. And most services, they have an unquoted path, right? So what's an unquoted path and how can this be used in attacks? Now, do you see this called path to executable, right? So when you set up a service, right? The path to the executable must be in quotes, right? So Windows knows which path to exactly look into. In some cases, when the, when the path to the executable of the service is not in quotes, Windows tries to look for that 
executable in different areas. It basically checks different iterations of the path to find the executable, right? And if the service is running under admin privileges or the local system privileges, like I said, attackers can misuse the service to perform any activity they want. For instance, here I have a screenshot where an attacker has added a backdoor user to an active directory group. They've abused the service Apache, and this has happened because the service was unquoted, point number one. And point number two was the service was running under system privileges, right? Not just make backdoor changes, the, the attacker can launch any executable, I repeat, any executable under local system privileges just because the service was unquoted, right? The path of the service was not in quotes, and that could lead to this incident. Just a simple way how a misconfiguration can lead to an active byte reads. Let's take a look at a few more misconfigurations. Now, we all know permissions in Active Directory, right? What are permissions in Active Directory? If I open up my virtual machine, my domain controller, if I right click on any object, like for instance, this OU right here, do you see this? These are permissions on the OU, right? Users can be allowed permissions, users can be denied permissions. And uh, whenever you try and delegate control on an OU, where you can give a user rights like reset passwords or create accounts. The thing that will be changed on the OU is the security tab, also known as the NT security descriptor, right? Now, in most cases, yeah, in most cases, objects in Active Directory have permissions that admins are really not aware of. For example, the OU could have, someone in the OU uh, could have full control over the OU that we may not know about, right? Similarly, permissions can be changed for a group. Similarly, permissions can be changed on a specific user or even the computers in your network, right? In some cases, OUs can be nested inside each other, like one OU inside another OU. And when OUs are nested inside each other, permissions can be inherited and permissions can also be explicitly defined, right? For example, uh, let's see if I have a nested OU here. So do you see these two OUs right here? Sharmila OU1 and Sharmila, right? So if you define certain privileges on the parent OU, it will flow down to the child OU, right? For example, on my parent OU, I want to deny write privileges and read privileges to a user, right? So the user will automatically have deny privileges on the child OU as well, right? But if I change permissions on the child OU, if I say, if I give the user allow privilege to read and write things inside the child OU, what happens is this privilege will take precedence over the inherited privilege, right? The explicitly assigned privilege will take precedence over the inherited privilege. And that's how misconfigurations happen, right? Here's one more such example. Uh, do you see this called the system container? This is a default container in Active Directory. Every Active Directory domain controller has this container. And here you see this folder called the admin SD folder. So here's what I'm gonna do, right? I'm gonna right click on this. I'm gonna head into properties, select the security tab and give everybody full control over this container. Now, what happens when I do that? When I give full control over the admin SD holder container, I'm essentially passing on the full control privilege to all these protected groups and objects, right? Because this container is responsible for permissions on these objects. A permission change on this container will give the user privileges on all these objects, groups like administrators, groups, domain admins group, right? Here's a simple example as to how a misconfigured permission can give a user privileges in Active Directory. Right. Let's take a look at a few more examples. Right. I'm going to show you a video right now. And if you take a look at your screen on your left, you'll notice an MSI application or a Windows installer application. Right. So when this application is run, it gives you a GUI, right, to add a user, a backdoor user, to an Active Directory group, namely the administrators group. Right? You can add, use, add the user to any group, right? So once you've given the username, once you've given the password, and once you say create, the user is added to the group. And if I open up the administrators group, 
here I have the user who is the member of the group, right? So what just happened here? How could a user, you know, simply log in and execute an application and add a user to a group in Active Directory? This happened because of another misconfiguration, right? Misconfigurations in Active Directory lead to breaches. And in this case, the misconfiguration was a group policy setting that was enabled. Do you see this group policy setting called always install with elevated privileges? When this is enabled, it gives your end users the right to execute MSI applications or Windows installer applications under local system privileges or local admin privileges. That's why the usage of malicious MSIs or malicious Windows installer application in Active Directory is running rampant. Right? So this is one way this misconfiguration, this attack would have occurred, but there could be many ways this misconfiguration could have occurred. And as you can see, the MSI will give the attacker the right to add a user to administrators group, domain admins group, instantly giving the uh, attacker domain admin access. Right? Now I want to talk about one more misconfigured permissions and they are security groups. Right? Now we all check our security groups for permissions. We all ensure that our admin groups only have the members that they have. But one thing that we sometimes, sometimes miss is uh, nested group memberships, right? So if you see group A, group A is a member of group B. If I open up group B, you see group B is a member of the administrators group, right? So what I'm trying to say here is group A nested in group B and group B has administrators privilege and via nested privileges, the members of group A, all these members are essentially administrators, right? We may check the direct members of the group, but we may not check the members that are nested into groups, basically groups nested inside each other, right? One more example when we talk about groups is uh, when you install services or applications, they may introduce new groups in your active directory environment, right? For example, when Exchange is installed, it installs new groups called Exchange Windows Permissions, Exchange Trusted Subsystem, Organization Management, and many other groups, right? So what, what are these groups and why are they important? Whenever you install an application, the groups that the application introduces may have certain privileges that you may be unaware of, right? For example, the Exchange Trusted Subsystem group has the right to erase the security log on your domain. So any user who's a member of this Exchange Subsystem group can clear the security log without even having to be an administrator, right? The exchange windows permissions group that you see right here will give the attacker the ability to modify permissions on an admin, on the domain level, on the domain DNS node. So any attacker who's a member of the exchange windows permissions group can modify permissions on the domain node. So if the attacker decides to give any user or everyone full control he can do that. So essentially in this case, everybody on the domain has full control over every object under the domain. Right? Uh, one more way, here's one more example how this could go wrong. Let me right click on this. Let me head into properties. Let me check out the security tab. And if I scroll down, right? Do you see this called replicating directory changes or replicating directory changes all, right? So if the attacker is a member of the Exchange Windows Permissions Group, if the attacker has rights over the domain DNS node, right? Then the attacker can give himself or any other user replicating directory changes permissions. Now, what are these permissions and why are they important for your active directory environment? The replicating directory changes permissions are essentially permissions used by your domain controllers, like DC1, DC2, to update each other of the changes, right? So if a user's password is being changed, DC1 uses the replicating privileges to update DC2 of the changes. It's kind of like a push and pull request, right? But if a user has these privileges, then the user could request for password hashes on the domain, and it could be the password hashes of any user, including the administrators, right? So let me quickly show you a video right here where this is an example of a Mimikatz DC sync attack where an attacker 
can request the password hashes of any user on the domain because he or she has admin privileges on the domain, right? So here's what's going to happen. You say dump DC sync. This is the name of the domain. This is the name of the user, namely the administrator. And within one second, we have the administrator's password hash right in front of us, right? Here you go. Let me quickly show that to you again. Here you go. So what can you do with the hash? You could use the hash to perform a pass the hash attack, remotely log in as the administrator, or you could take the hash, open up free tools on the internet like crackstation.net and try and brute force the hash or break the hash to get access to the plain text password, right? Just another way how misconfigured security groups can lead to security incidents. Right? So we spoke about a lot of things. We spoke about how groups can lead to security incidents. We spoke about how certain group policies can lead to security incidents. We spoke about how active directory permissions can lead to security incidents. We spoke about unported service paths and how they could lead to a security incidents. And the reason I spoke about all of this is to just let you know that misconfigurations are very common in AD and these must misconfigurations can be leveraged by an attacker to become a domain admin, right? So one more thing I wanted to add was that the permissions that your users have, right? If your user has unknown permissions, then the user may perform attribute level changes on an object. For example, the user may reset a password for another user. The password, uh, the user may add another user to a security group or uh, certain attributes of an object can be modified, right? And whenever these changes happens, what happens is everything is yet again dumped into the security log and you'll have to read through the security log to truly find out which attribute has been changed for what object. And let's face it, it's not easy to work with security logs. It's time consuming. It does not give you the bird's eye view that you need, right? So just an example of a few misconfigurations, how they could lead to a security incident. And I want to take you to the next part of today's thing. And that's Active Directory is targeted for vulnerability exploitation. Right? Now, what do I mean by vulnerabilities? Like any software, Active Directory has its own set of vulnerabilities. Right? For example, the attacker may have rights to execute remote code. The attacker may have rights to elevate privileges. The attacker may bypass security features like uh, your Windows log on security. The attacker may tamper processes running on the system. The list simply goes on. And here's one such a vulnerability that made news in 2020 and it's called the zero log on attack right now i do not want to get into the specifics of the attack just know that client servers in your system must authenticate with the domain controller and when clients authenticate with the domain controller they use a protocol called the net logon protocol right and the net logon protocol well it had a few flaws that the attacker could leverage to impersonate any server on the domain that's right flaws within the net logon protocol could be used by the attacker to impersonate any server, including the domain controller. All the attacker had to do was enter a password that was nothing but 0000, and he or she was good to go. They could impersonate any server on the domain, right? So for vulnerabilities in AD, I would encourage you to keep an eye out for these vulnerabilities, patch them before it's too late, if you wish to read more about the zero logon attack, I've written a blog on it, and I'm going to quickly share a link to this blog. So if you want to learn more how this attack works and why it happens, uh, you've got access to that. So I'm going to quickly leave a link to it in the chat window right about now. All right. So the only fix to vulnerabilities really is to patch your systems, right? And once you patch your systems, one more thing I'd like for you to do is to monitor these vulnerabilities for exploitation. For example, if an attacker uses the zero logon flaw or the net logon vulnerability, then the connection would be denied because you patched your system. But then again, it's important for you to monitor why the connection was denied, right? Because when you do this, you uh, can actually trace an attacker who's trying to use this uh, vulnerable net logon connection to break into your active directory environment, right? Microsoft has done a few workarounds with vulnerabilities as well. For example, in this net logon attack, 
what Microsoft has done is that they've introduced a group policy setting where you can add non-compliant devices to actually use the vulnerable network one connection, right? So what I'm trying to say here is the patch that you see, it cannot be applied to all systems. There are certain non-compliant systems for which the patch won't work. And to overcome that difficulty, to let the server still authenticate with the domain controller, Microsoft has introduced a group policy option where you can add the authorized servers on your domain, right? And when a connection is allowed, that's something you may want to look into as well, right? So that's my point here. After you patch your vulnerabilities, don't just patch them and assume things would be okay. It would be great if you could monitor these patches, monitor these vulnerabilities for further signs of exploitation. Right. Just one example as to how vulnerabilities in Active Directory run rampant. There are many more examples like this. Like, for example, there was a Windows DNS server RCE or remote code, code execution vulnerability, also known as SIGRID, where an attacker could execute arbitrary code under local system privileges again. Right. The attacker could execute any code under local system rights. Now, we spoke about misconfigurations, where we saw group misconfigurations, group policy misconfigurations. We saw uncoded service paths. We spoke about how certain default vulnerabilities like zero logon or the cigarette vulnerability and how that could lead to an incident. And the third part and the third reason why I think the attacks happen in Active Directory is because there are certain areas in Active Directory that still remain unmonitored, right? For example, in the SolarWinds hack, it is speculated, this is not confirmed news, but it is speculated that Active Directory may be a crucial link, right? Because attackers use techniques like password guessing or password spray, a technique that I just showed you, to basically uh, try and compromise the ADFS mechanism that was going on in the network, right? The Active Directory Federation service mechanism, right? Attackers use built-in Windows tools and features like WMI, to propagate from one server to another in the network, right? There are certain ransomware attacks in Active Directory that yet again use built-in Active Directory and Windows tools and features, right? For example, a snake ransomware attack was pretty rampant back in 2020. It affected companies like Honda and Enel. And what the snake ransomware does is it attacks your system and when it attacks your system, it assumes domain admin privileges, right? Which means the attacker already had access to the domain admin account before he, he, before he or she even launched the ransomware campaign. This is also known as a targeted ransomware attack, right? So what the snake ransomware essentially does is it kills a list of processes, for example, backup processes, or even your Windows even fewer, then logging won't work. Uh, it uses tools like WMI, protocols like WMI to propagate from one server to another. It uses built-in Windows features like syswall to spread malware in the network, right? Now, if you've seen syswall folders in your network, they are essentially used to apply group policy settings to the other servers or other nodes in your network, right? So if you've got group policy settings, computer configuration settings, user configuration settings, what uh, the syswall folder does is it applies these group policy settings to the computers and users in your network, right? But what Snake Ransomware is doing is that it's using this folder to propagate malware instead of actually legitimate group policies. So what I'm trying to say here is the simplest things that you may not monitor may be indications of a security attack. For example, you wouldn't check your syswall folder for Snake Ransomware files or new files. You wouldn't monitor all your servers for processes that were killed, especially if the process is not privileged enough. If it's not halting any business continuity, then you wouldn't check that process. And you wouldn't check for new processes that are being spawned across your system, right? You wouldn't check for script executions like PowerShell scripts that are executed in your environment, which could be indications of an attack, right? Speaking of PowerShell scripts, I just wanted to show you that PowerShell scripts, the capabilities of using PowerShell as a malicious attack tool is quickly increasing, right? For example, here's a script on the internet. It's called Lucky Strike. This is a GitHub repository. 
and it's basically a powershell utility in order to in order for you to create malicious office documents right so using this utility you can create an infected or a malware written microsoft document and the document could be made to do anything for example you could take the document place it in a public share that many users access right have a clickbaity name like so and if the user tries and opens the document the user's credentials will be sent back to the attacker system right or the attacker may have remote control over the user system right just an example as to how an infected or a malware written office macro can not just be used in phishing attacks but informed attackers can place this infected document in a publicly accessible share to launch the attack right so again there are a lot of things that can go wrong with active directory things can be misconfigured areas that are unmonitored could uh, attackers could leverage areas that are unmonitored like any software active directory has its own vulnerabilities that microsoft takes its own sweet time to patch which can be used in a security incident and a simple thing like deviation from a typical user behavior could be indications of a security attack right for example if a user is logging on at 3 am then it could be something wrong right if uh, a number of files are being moved or are being accessed it could be something wrong if a new process has randomly spawned across your member server or your domain controller it could be indications of an attack and you need to monitor your devices and your users for behavioral changes right if there are deviations from what typical user behavior can be it could be indications of a security attack all right and this is where we can help because ad audit plus a component of log 360 right here can look into different components of your active directory network right now this session was a little advanced because i'm pretty sure most of you would have heard of basic active directory attacks i just wanted to show you how advanced active directory attacks can get right and what ad audit trust does is it monitors your network your active directory environment in real time for changes all right for example a simple log on activity happening across an endpoint a member server or a workstation could be indications of it the log on could be a remote log on activity right the log on could be a local log on activity similarly there may be a user account for which any attribute may have been changed the user may have been given an attribute like password never expires or a group policy setting may have been enabled or a group policy may have been deleted or created or a permission may have been changed on any of your objects so what these reports do is they take these logs they take the mess of the logs that you have in active directory right and they segregate the logs the sec they section the logs into object based reports based on operations on the objects that are easy to read easy to understand so you can quickly grasp and understand what's happening in your active directory network right all of these reports are searchable you can go back in time and find things that you need if you have multiple domain controllers you can view reports for multiple domain controllers as well right so this entire tab more than enough for you to monitor your active directory environment and speaking of your servers like your member servers or your workstations or your work group machines they need to be looked into as well right for example if a script is being executed on a server by a user who's really who really has no job executing scripts you must know who that user is and why is he executing the script and what are the code what is the code within the script what is the function block or the function call that is used in the script if a user is not trying to run commands on powershell that and he or she is not really supposed to do that you can get to know what the commands are right which command was invoked right if a process is started randomly on a server if a process is stopped or halted or exited it could be indications of malware or a ransomware attack right so the list simply goes on for example if the syswall folder a system file a security file if it's being changed then you have to monitor that and file integrity monitoring can help you with that file integrity monitoring can also help you monitor your root files and folders like program files 86 or your linux root folders right 
So the list simply goes on. There's a lot that AD Audit Plus can do with respect to Active Directory security. And all of these reports that you see can be alerted, right? So those of you who already have AD Audit Plus may, might already know this. These alerts can be uh, sent to an admin via email, via SMS. These alerts can be uh, further customized. For example, if there's a user being added to a group outside of business hours, then you can alert the admin via email and SMS, right? You can filter alerts based on attribute values, based on usernames, based on server names. The list simply goes on. You can filter alerts based on thresholds. For example, if there are more than 10 logon failures occurring in under a minute, then you receive an alert, right? And all of these alerts that you see, they are completely actionable. Meaning you can have a script here that can be executed whenever this alert pops up in your environment. For example, if a user is added to a security group in outside of business hours, right? The script that you see right here will disable that user who was newly added to the group until you come the next day and you check out that the user is actually legit, actually authorized, and you can again enable that user, right? Just an example of a use case, you can customize the alerts however you want, you can customize the script however you want, and you can set the script to act accordingly, according uh, with respect to the alert that was generated, right? There's a lot more AD Audit Plus can do. For example, it can look into your user behavioral patterns and monitor them for changes, right? For example, if a user is logging on to a host for the first time, it could be malicious, right? If there's a new process on a server, it could be something new. It could be something malicious. If there are a number of files or folders that were accessed, modified, or deleted, these are all changes from what behavior is deemed to be normal. These are all anomalies, and the analytics report will monitor those changes for you. This basically monitors your user behaviors, and if there is a deviation from what's, what's the expected behavior, then you will immediately receive an alert if you've got alert set up with any audit plus, right? So that is about it for today. The next session will be on July 6th, where we will talk about Azure AD, right? Now, we cannot ignore that many people who have Active Directory are actually adopting cloud services like Microsoft Azure. And Active Directory and Azure are interconnected. They work together. And it's important that we strengthen that connection and we strengthen Azure AD as well, right? So on July 6th, we'll talk about Azure AD. And one more crucial component we still haven't covered is data storage, right? Your file storage devices like NetApp, EMC, Windows file servers, Windows Cloud file clusters. How can you secure your data and your environment? Because honestly, that's the one thing that attackers are after. So on July 6th, Azure AD security and application security that run with Azure and data storage security, all right? So that is about it for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention.